Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our continuing study in the book of 2 Corinthians. I'm Ken Chapman, and the co-host in our study, of course, is Jonathan Caldwell. Uh, we've been going through this somewhat neglected letter. It's certainly not studied and is well known as the first epistle uh, to the church at Corinth, but it's definitely one that needs to be studied uh, as kind of the follow-up to uh, that chastising what I believe Paul refers to in the second epistle as that first uh, harsh letter or tearful letter uh, that he wrote to them. Uh, and for me, at least, it's been a beneficial study and, and uh, glad that you've been able to join us. Uh, Jonathan, you doing all right tonight? Doing well. I likewise have uh, definitely benefited uh, from this study. Uh, in, in my life, I had never, other than just, you know, a few passages here and there, dealt much with this letter, so I've definitely enjoyed it. Okay, well, let's just get right into the text. Last week, Jonathan led us in a study that kind of awkwardly brought us through to chapter 7, verse 1. Now, that awkwardness wasn't Jonathan's fault. Uh, it was the awkward chapter break there. Uh, and so this section, really the entirety of chapter 7 that we're going to look at tonight, really begins in verse 2. And so we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 16. Now, that's kind of a lengthy section, uh, but it, it's one that we needed to take together because uh, the, the flow of thought is consistent throughout this whole section, and since it is a lengthy re reading, we've had to break it down into uh, separate slides, and so we'll take each section uh, at a time, and our first section is going to be verses 2 through 4, and I'm going to ask Jonathan, uh, if he would, to read the text for us, and then we'll dive in. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 2 through 4, make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. Okay, Paul uses a an expression or a word in our translations here that that rings with some familiarity is what he's talked about earlier in the epistle when he says, make room in your hearts for us. You remember he had said in chapter six, really the section right before this section, if we take out that kind of interruption when he talks about being unequally yoked, uh, he had concluded that section by saying in chapter six, verses 11 through 13, our heart is open wide and then he encouraged them to widen your hearts also. Uh, and so this idea of this heart connection, the opening of the hearts, and Paul continues that same thought here where he literally says, make room for us uh, in this section. Uh, now, if we kind of go back a little bit to that last section, uh, in chapter 6, beginning in verse 14, going through chapter 7, verse 1, it talked about being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, Paul seems to be maybe making a connection. You can't make room for us if you are associated with them. Uh, and so he's kind of forcing them to a choice that they need to make. And so he's saying, don't be unequally yoked with them, but be yoked with me. Uh, and make room for us uh, in your hearts. And so throughout this section, we're going to see that Paul's concern and really worry that based upon that first letter, that their relationship may have been broken uh, or at least damaged by uh, the strength of that earlier letter. Uh, and so Paul is trying to uh, in his rejoicing that that wasn't the case, but also trying to kind of mend some fences. Uh, throughout this section, I'm going to be using the analogy of, of a parent disciplining a child. You know, many times uh, with a young child, you may have to discipline them pretty harshly, uh, and then nothing's better after that spanking's been given out that a little bit of time has passed, and the tears dry up a little bit, and that little child comes and crawls back in your lap, and, and, and you hug them and let them know that there's still that love there, and that seems to be what's going on here. Paul has spanked them in the first letter, and now is the idea of the reconciliation, that there's still the love that's here, 
Uh, there, th this did not damage our relationship. It certainly didn't end that relationship. And so make room for us. Now, we also see in this some um, hints at what we've been talking about earlier, that the opponents of Paul in Corinth, who were probably these Judaizing teachers, uh, had raised some accusations against Paul in attacking the message. They were really attacking the messenger. And so Paul, to his defense, again, but much of 2 Corinthians is going to be Paul coming to his own defense. He says, we've wronged no one we've corrupted no one, and we've taken advantage of no one. Now, what we don't know is, the, are these just general statements that Paul is saying, we didn't do this, and so accept us, make room in your hearts for us? Or is it possible that Paul is answering actual uh, accusations that have been leveled against him? Had, had these opponents, these false teachers, said Paul had wronged someone and maybe even had a, a, a list of ways that he had done that, that Paul had corrupted some by his teaching that they obviously disagreed with, that he had taken advantage. Now, the New King James, I believe, uses the word defrauded no one. And so is it possible, remember in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, he had talked to them about the, them laying by in store on the first day of the week, and so that he would come and take up that collection and take it to Judea. Uh, is it possible that these false teachers, the opponents of Paul, had leveled the accusation that Paul was defrauding them? He was taking advantage of using that money uh, for maybe at least part of it for his own personal benefit. And but Paul just says, absolutely not. We've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We haven't taken advantage or defrauded anyone uh, at all. The, it's important to remember here that we are just reading one side of this conversation. They know exactly what Paul's talking about here. It's kind of like when you post something uh, cryptic on Facebook, you know, people always do those passive aggressive uh, post on Facebook, uh, you know, sometimes the people you love the most will stab you the hardest. Uh, and, you know, everyone's like, well, I wonder who they're talking about. Uh, well, those who did the stabbing know what's being discussed there. Uh, and then just a, a small clarification. Uh, you mentioned first Corinthians in, in first Corinthians, it's chapter 16, where he discusses the, the contribution. Uh, it's, it's, uh, next week in second Corinthians eight and nine, uh, where we'll look at the, uh, uh contribution again. Uh, in, yeah. in that letter. Yeah, appreciate that correction. You're right. It's 1 Corinthians 16, where uh, he talks about that collection that maybe, again, they were accusing him of, of taking advantage uh, of. But Paul says, I, I don't say any of this to condemn you, uh, for I've said before that you're in our hearts to die together and to live together. Uh, my, from my end, Paul is saying, this relationship is still as strong as it has ever been. Been. In fact, he says, I'm acting with great boldness towards you. Again, there may be a hint to the language. Some had accused Paul of uh, may being bold in his letters and weak in person. And Paul may be, again, using a little of that language to almost taunt those false teachers. I'm acting with great boldness uh, towards you. In fact, boldness, not just in the boldness of that first letter, the boldness of condemning and correcting you, but I'm acting in great boldness of love towards you. And so that shows us, again, back to the parental relationship, the strength of the discipline has to be matched with the strength of the love, uh, or it becomes an abusive relationship. And so it, here it is with Paul. I spoke with boldness, but I'm also, when it comes to love, speaking with boldness towards you. Uh, in fact, I have great pride in you, and I'm filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I'm overflowing with joy. Paul is just effusive in his praise uh, for these Corinthians, and we're going to see why as we continue reading uh, here, why Paul is just saying, we would say today in, in, in our southern vernacular, I'm just tickled to death. Uh, to be a part of you and to know you uh, and the good that you've done. I'm just overflowing with joy, uh, Paul says. And we're going to see why, what, what made Paul so proud, as he said, and so comforted uh, and so overflowing uh, 
uh, with joy in spite of the affliction that he will mention many times uh, in this letter. Uh, I'm glad that we're doing this. Here's why. And, and Jonathan, will you continue our reading verses five through nine? For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he has comforted, was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, although I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. Okay, so here's the reason for the exuberant joy that Paul has and the pride that he has toward these Corinthians is that he's saying, I finally heard back from Titus. So let's remind ourselves a little bit of, of this story. Paul had sent this letter. Now, what letters being talked about here is really in dispute. Some argue that this is a letter that was written to the church that falls in between first and 2 Corinthians, a letter that we simply don't have today. I would argue that this is probably just talking about the letter of 1 Corinthians, that bold, harsh letter uh, that was there. And so he had sent that. Titus was sent either with that letter or in a subsequent visit to kind of check on things to see how they were doing. And now Paul is waiting to hear back. Now, we talk about this a lot. Imagine the differences in communication. We get annoyed if somebody doesn't answer our text instantly. Uh, but this communication in the first century would have been at a snail's pace. And so this letter was sent. Timothy was sent to hear how things were going. And Paul is waiting and anxiously waiting because this could have gone a lot of different ways. Uh, they could have heard that letter and been offended by it and really driven further away. Well, Paul, if you're going to be that way, then just forget you. And apparently some of the opponents uh, had done just that. And so Paul is anxious to hear what's the condition of these brethren. How did they receive that letter? Are they making corrections uh, or did that in some sense make things worse and drive them away. And so he's waiting for Titus. And in fact, he says, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were afflicted, uh, fighting within and without, and we just couldn't stand it. And so here he is waiting in Macedonia. Now this harkens back to chapter two. Remember in chapter two, verses 12 and 13, he referenced this. Uh, in fact, it says there, when I came to Troas, to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened to me in the Lord, my spirit had no rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. And so here's kind of the rest of the story of that incident. And we looked at this map, you remember, in chapter two. In fact, Jonathan, you led us in that discussion. And so uh, tell us kind of what's going on in the travels here of both Titus and Paul. Well, Paul is uh, east of Troas. He's headed towards Troas, while uh, Titus is in Corinth. And the plan was that they would meet up at Troas. And it seems like the plan was for Titus to get on a ship to go across the Aegean Sea, uh, obviously the quickest way to get there. However, he seems that he wasn't on the last ship of the season. Uh, as, as dangerous as sailing, sailing was, it was even more dangerous in the winter. And so you'd have that last load that would come in. Well, he wasn't on uh, that ship. And Paul, it, it, it's almost sad. Uh, Paul is actually able to, to do some good things in Troas, uh, but his heart is so overwhelmed uh, that he can't focus. Uh, and he has to hear from Titus. And so Paul begins to head over land to Titus, uh, and then Titus is going to have to head over land to Paul. And so they wind up meeting in Macedonia 
uh, they probably had some places in mind that they would meet, some brethren uh, that they were both going to stay with probably. And so instead of that little quick jut across the sea, they wind up having to meet at a secondary location there. Hey, thanks for that explanation, that reminder. And, and again, as we said, this delay was sheer torture uh, mm -hmm. for Paul to hear how this letter had been received and how the brethren were faring. I think there was a lot on his mind. He was concerned for Titus. Yeah. Was Titus okay? Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe the ship sunk or, right. or something happened to Titus. He's sick and in a ditch, you know, like your mother worried you was in a ditch dying somewhere uh, when you didn't make it home and curfew on time. Or, or maybe Titus... Uh, has been mistreated by these brethren, or the brethren have fallen away completely. There's just a lot on his mind. Uh, in fact, later, Paul will talk about when that list of hardships, uh, the, the greatest of those, he says, is my concern for all the churches. Well, the, phrase, exactly. here, the phrase in this section is the fighting without and the fear within. Yeah. Uh, and, and just that, because, you know, the, the, the beatings in, uh, and you know, the, the, the physical hardships in, boy, you can, you can worry yourself through a whole night, uh, about various things. And it seems that Paul was doing that. Yeah. And that's certainly here, but he heard the good news. And just like he did back in chapter one, verses four through seven, Paul's going to try to see how many times he can use the word comfort, uh, in just a sentence. And so he says, uh, but God who comforts the downcast, comforted us with the coming of Titus. It's almost like he says, it was good news. It was better than we hoped for. Uh, you received this in just the spirit it was intended. You're making these corrections. Uh, and that was a load off our minds. And so he comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, that is my personal concern for Titus, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. And so it was all good news. Titus was okay, and you're okay spiritually. Uh, and he told us, he says, of your longing, your mourning, and your zeal for me. Uh, again, what a wonderful relief that you still love me, Paul is saying, that you're longing for me. I'm probably longing to see me. Uh, it was good to see Titus. It was good to get the letters, but they're longing probably to see Paul and your mourning. Now, we're going to see that later, the idea of their mourning. Obviously, this is a spiritual mourning, mourning for their sins and your zeal for me, your uh, zealous interest, your jealous interest in me and my work as an apostle and our relationship uh, together. And so Paul says, what wonderful news we received when we finally hooked up again with Titus. You likened this earlier to the father-child or parent-child relationship. Uh, well, there's that phrase that parents will sometimes utter. Maybe it's more cliche than it is actually uttered, but it's, this is going to hurt me a lot worse than it hurts you. Uh, and, and you can see that with Paul here. Uh, this, is, this has broken him to have to do this thing. Uh, it, just as when you have to maybe spank a child or discipline a child, uh, there's that twin uh, tinge of, of, of maybe some guilt. Uh, and and you, you love them. You don't want to have to to, to cause them this pain. And so Paul is just starving uh, for them to, you know, come crawl up in the lap, like you said earlier. And that's finally happened. And, and what, a, what a joy that is. And so he says, so I rejoiced still more. Because then he goes on to say, for if I made you grieve with my letter, your translation may say, if, if I caused you sorrow, and so if this is 1 Corinthians, it would have been a letter that might have caused them sorrow because on every page, Paul is correcting them and telling them something they did wrong. And so no wonder it would grieve them and no wonder Paul would be concerned about that. Ken, if, if there was a letter that would make somebody grieve or be sorrowful more than 1 Corinthians, I would be nervous to read it. <laughs> uh, and, and I know there's that debate there about a sorrowful letter, uh, but man, how much more uh, harsh and, and uh, 
uh, rebuking can Paul get uh, than, than what you read in 1 Corinthians? And so I, I, that just kind of popped into my head as you were, as you were talking there uh, about what is said there and, and how they do respond to it. Yeah, and you're right. Some would argue that 1 Corinthians can't be the sorrowful letter. It can't be a letter that Paul wrote with tears. And I'm with you. Then if, if that's not a letter that could be sorrowful or cause grief or cause tears by the, the author of it, then I don't want to see how harsh that letter uh, mm -hmm. is. And so I'd see no reason to look otherwise than the first letter uh, to the church at Corinth. So I made you grieve, but I do not regret it though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a little while. Now, this language almost kind of con contradictory. I, I, I didn't regret it, but I did regret it. I don't think it's that difficult to understand, especially in the context of, of what we've been using as our analogy. Every parent can relate to that, uh, of, of disciplining a child as Jonathan said, the old adage, this hurts me more than it does you. I don't know that I buy that. I've been on both ends of spankings, and I think it hurts worse to receive than it does. But I understand the sentiment. It's not pleasant uh, to do that. And so you feel bad about doing that sometimes, but you know it was for the best. And so I think that's certainly the sentiment that Paul uh, is trying to get across here. Uh, so I rejoice, not because that you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. In other words, I rejoice because it worked. For you felt a godly grief. And again, your translation, you may be more familiar with the expression, a godly sorrow, uh, so that you suffered no loss through us. Uh, and so it turned out that letter was received just as it was intended, as a loving reprimand, a loving admonition uh, to get you to change. And so we're going to talk about this idea of the godly grief or godly sorrow uh, as we move into the next section. And, and Jonathan, when you read that for us. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 13, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. So he says, I'm glad that I made you sorry, or I grieved you, because it was a godly grief. Now, Paul famously here contrasts godly grief with worldly grief, or godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Uh, there's a difference, the idea of being sorrowful. Maybe the greatest illustration, and I just preached a sermon about this, Jonathan, is the, the comparison and the contrast between Peter and Judas. Right. They both wronged Jesus really at the same moment, uh, but then they were both sorry for what they did. Uh, but Peter's was a godly sorrow, and Judas had that worldly sorrow. The, the, diff, the main difference to me is the idea of what we do with that grief. Uh, and we can, in some sense, we can become a Judas uh, in, in the sense that we may commit spiritual suicide that we just overwhelmed by that grief and by that sorrow that we can never come back from it. But the point of it wasn't to drive them further away, but it was to drive them back uh, to God. And so repentance begins with this idea of sorrow, but it has to be a sorrow that motivates and moves and, and accomplishes something. And look what it accomplishes. What earnestness, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. And so that's what grief does. That's what sorrow does. And in our soft society where we don't want to offend anybody or step on anybody's toes or tell anybody that they're wrong, you know, you've got your truth, I've got my truth, we're, I'm okay, you're okay kind of society. Paul is saying, no, grief and sorrow has its place look what it can do. Uh, it can cause this fear and indignation. Those are, and punishment, those are bad words. 
but they lead to good things, earnestness, eagerness, longing, and zeal. And so there is a place for correction. There is a place for sorrow in the life and in the preaching uh, uh, to, to Christians. And so he says, I wrote to you not for the sake of the one who did the wrong. Now, who's this one? There's, I think there's three legitimate options of who this might be. The most obvious one would be the offender in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the fornicator. Uh, some of the strongest language that was used in that first letter was reserved for that fornicator who had his father's wife. And so he may be referencing that one uh, that I think is referenced also uh, later or additionally in this uh, 2 Corinthians. Some say that it was maybe the ringleader of the false teachers and the opponents uh, there at Corinth. Another possibility is that it's no one person in mind. It's just talking about the one, a one uh, who does the wrong. And in that sense, it could be talking about uh, the, the entirety of the church at Corinth. And the one who suffered the wrong in this regard maybe be Paul uh, as being offended by them and by their actions. But, uh, but regardless, he says that the point was that for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. That was the goal, was to get you right with God and, and to reconcile that relationship, not just my relationship with you, but more importantly, God's relationship. And that's been done. Therefore, we are comforted. All right, Jonathan, let's, let's read and look at this last section of chapter 7. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Okay, Paul says we were comforted by Titus getting to know you and know what good people you were. Now, had Titus read 1 Corinthians? If he had read 1 Corinthians, it's probably hard for him to believe when Paul started boasting about the church at Corinth. Oh, these are good people, Car uh, Paul, Titus. These are, these are good, godly people. They'll receive this letter. And Titus is probably going, uh, that's not the people I'm reading about in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and Paul says, but my spirit has been refreshed because his spirit was refreshed. He sees what I was talking about. He sees the church at Corinth that I know and love. And that's seen in your correction. And so he says, for whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. Uh, again, we are guilty of that today, aren't we? We love to bash the church at Corinth. We read 1 Corinthians and boy, we just get them told of how bad they were and how terrible they were. But when you read 2 Corinthians, you get a different picture of this church, the picture of the church that Paul loved, that, that they were wanting to correct. They were seeking Paul's correction and help in understanding what they needed to do. And so Paul says, I boast about you. Now, is this a subtle little uh, hint to them uh, that I came to your defense? Now, where are you to come to my defense in the face of this opposition? Paul uses his uh, defense of himself. He uses the term boasting. Uh, throughout this letter uh, as a, as a tongue in cheek way of referring to him having to defend himself. And maybe this is a little intentional, little guilt trip that he's putting on them. Look, you, you're not boasting about me. You're not defending me enough to these opponents, but I'm here defending you. I'm here boasting of you. And I was not put to shame. And maybe the hint is you won't be put to shame either. If you'll come to my defense and boast about me. And so T Titus was able to see who you truly are. And because of that, I rejoice. Nothing makes uh, a parent happier that when their child receives the discipline and grows up to be a good young man or a woman, nothing makes a preacher happier to hear that the word has been received. Even sometimes a hard message was received in the spirit that it was intended and, and the people seek to make uh, the corrections uh, 
uh, that they ought to make in the preaching of the gospel. And so Paul says, I, I, I'm just rejoicing, uh, overjoyed that the way that you've received that letter. Jonathan? I'm thinking about this last phrase, and I, I can't help but wonder if he's stating that he has complete confidence, or is he maybe also implying or is he using that phrase to maybe put a little pressure on him? Now, you can do this. Uh, you know, Paul tells Philemon, I know that you will do above and beyond what we have asked of you. It's putting some pressure on Philemon. Um, he, he manipulates that and, and just, I don't like that word, but that's the right word. Uh, and so maybe he's doing that a little bit here. Uh, you know, hey, you've got to do this. You can do this. Uh, you can you can do this. Uh, stay with it. Uh, stay faithful. You know, it's kind of like, again, the parent-child relationship. A parent may say to a child, you're a good boy. You you share your toys and you're nice and mm -hmm. you don't cry and complain. You know, it, some of that's boasting on them, but also some of that, okay, that's what you need to do. I'm saying right. you're that, now live up to it. It certainly right. may be uh, the case here. And so the lesson we learn is how will we respond to the correction that we receive uh, in the word of God? We will we'll give Paul and others like him cause to rejoice, uh, or will we be experiencing worldly grief or worldly sorrow? We rejoice that the word's being received in the way that it's intended. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Join us next Monday night where we'll move into chapter eight. I think Jonathan is going to have the Herculean task of covering two chapters, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, and we'll do that next Monday night. Thanks for joining us.